Volume 1, Book 2, The Paper Age. And it opens with Chapter 1, which is titled Astria Redux, which uh, is a spin on this man here, Louis Sebastien Messier's play called L'an 2440 here, the year 2440, which originally was translated into English as uh, Astrid's Dream, it's a story that you can see here, it's a utopian novel, pretty much from Carlyle's perspective, twinning with the utopianism of the age. So it would be typical, uh, first published 1771, so very typical of this uh, the paper age that he's that Carlyle is talking about here. He says, Were it even a glad event, it involves change, it involves loss of active force, and so far, either in the past or in the present, as an irregularity, a disease. So it's almost as if the paper age, it's full of this, this energy. The, uh, we can see here, he, uh, Messier wrote heroic epistles. Um, as well as his, in his drama, so it was very much a flourishing of, of paper activity, pamphleteering, and so on, that almost becomes infectious. Hence why Carlyle calls out the word disease there. He says, The oak grows silently in the forest a thousand years. Only in the thousandth year, when the woodman arrives with his axe, is there heard an echoing through the solitudes. So this is his juxtaposition. This is his contrast. Something that is sturdy as the oak, you it you can't notice it grow because of this, how slow its process is, and um, it's reaching to maturity. It, it that's a very different type of aging. Is it, well, it is it is an aging paper age. It doesn't really undergo the same process at all. It's activity. It's change. It's a whirlwind. It's a tempest. Or perhaps it's a disease raging through a population. He mentions here in his, uh, the, the manner he likes to do where he has these lists of, of sort of pl plural events. Attila invasions, Walter the penniless crusades, Sicilian vespers, 30 years wars. Mere sin and misery, not work, but hindrance of work. So these are examples of the whirlwind events. Happy the people whose annals are vacant, he says, is not without its true side. So happy the people whose annals are vacant, and he sort of twins on that a little bit. He says, Thomas, Thomas Carlyle incorrectly attributed the quotation of happy of those whose annals are vacant to Montesquieu, but it uh, it's really comes from Benjamin Franklin. Um, it's a play on Poor Richard Almanac, 1740, happy that nation, fortunate that age, whose history is not diverting. Sort of a play on that. Says, Dubaridum and its uh, deguillons are gone forever. There is young, still docile, well intentioned king. This is Louis the 16th that we left at the end of book one. A young, beautiful, and bountiful, well intentioned queen, Marie Antoinette. And with them all France, as it were, become young. This is the false pretense, the uh, the laugh that we had at the end of the, the carriage um, in book one, when they sort of get to grips with the fact, who was it? I believe it was, yeah, Monsignor d'Artois sets them all a laughter. That was at the end of the book one. So we're still in that sort of, it's a youthful king, but we're, we're getting, rather than that youthful energy, we're getting youthful naivety. The old Parlement Paris resumes its functions. Instead of a profligate, bankrupt Abbey Terre, we have now, for controller in general, a virtuous philosophic to go, with a whole reformed France in his head. So we can see here, controller general of the finances during the reign of Louis the Fifteenth. So he's really cast out, and he's to be replaced by. He's been to replace by. The philosophic to go. And we can see here when he's talking about Dubari ism, he's talking about uh, this sort of venture. Gone is Dubariism. The last Mitrus on Titre of Louis the Fifteenth, 
and one of the victims of the reign of terror. So she will be uh, be hit later, but at the moment, that sort of idea of practicing uh, Yusuf Maritare is going to finance the Dubaris, it's going to be that sort of um, unseen fi uh, finances where it, you know the king is just financing his mistresses and so on, that's going to be gone. We've got Tergo in charge now. He's philosophical, he's going to reform the finances. Now, from far from a patriarch Voltaire gives sign, veterans Diderot, d'Alembert, have lived to see this day. So all the old guard, all the original uh, sort of men of letters of France, Voltaire being chief among them, Diderot, d'Alembert, they're all giving their nods. They're going, yes, this is, this is a move in the correct direction. France is moving in the correct direction. This man here, Anne Robert Jacques Tagot, is the new controller. You can see here economic liberalism is thought to be the first economist to have recognized law of diminishing marginal returns in agriculture. So here is our philosophic man coming into effect after the death of Louis XV. Man awakens from his long somnambulism, chases the phantasms that beleaguer and bewitched him, behold the new morning glittering down the eastern steps. Fly, false phantasms, from its shafts of light. Let the absurd fly utterly, forsaking this lower earth forever. It is truth, an astrea redux, that in the shape of philosophism henceforth reign. So this sort of victory parade of Voltaire and Diderot. We have a man to go on, on the scene now. And all of the corruption is going to be gone. Benevolence has now begun reigning. So, the hope continues, and we're on to chapter two. Petition in Hieroglyphs. When the working people again, uh, it is not so well. So, what we see there is Voltaire's happy, Diderot's happy, D'Alembert's content. Uh, yet, this is really content of the literati. The, the sort of uh, the men of, of the paper age, not not your working man. No. Dreary languid do these struggle in their obscure remoteness, stare, hearth, cheerless. So the middle are content that those who believe they are go, you know, pushing forward with this enlightenment. But really, Joe Bloggs on the street, he's still suffering. He notices no change. What does it matter to him? Whether you have a, a Jean-Marie There, you know, coming in, pointed to 1736, an ecclesiastic councillor in the Parlement de Paris, or if you have a Turgot, who, you know, wants to be remembered for his economic liberalism, who gets the nods from Voltaire. No, it makes no difference to the man on the street, really. And uh, and so that is, that is really what Carlyle's getting at in chapter two. It's a short chapter, so we move on to chapter three, questionable. It's meanwhile, it is singular how long the rotten will hold together, provided you do not handle it roughly. For whole generations it continues standing with a ghastly affectation of life. After all, life and truth has fled out of it, so loath are men to quit their old ways. And conquering indolence and inertia venture on new. So, pretty self-explanatory. So it is interesting to note at this point that uh, he's quoting here holds confined within him a man made also the sort of language that you see in uh, Carlyle's novel Start of the Stars um, Taylor retailored Rash enthusiast of change beware hast thou well considered all that habit does in this life of ours how all knowledge and all practice hang wondrous over infinite abysses of the unknown impracticable and our whole being is an infinite abyss, overarched by habit. It's by a thin earth rind, laboriously built together. The, uh, the usual Carlylean words of caution against pointless and radical change. Habit is what has knit together the, the fabric of something that actually has shape. Otherwise, you have chaos. Continues on. But if every man, as it has been written, holds confined within him a madman, 
what must every society do? This is an insight into his own belief. Every man in him does have the own madman. And this is, could be seen in Carlyle himself, where sometimes he is quite specific on dates, quite specific on processes. He's the mathematician from Edinburgh. When then he gets captured by this the zeal, this pure energy. And he loses that focus but also gains a lot of energy. So it's quite interesting when he switches to that those between those two styles in his writing. But so he would have been very agreeable with the notion that there is a madman contained within someone because it came out so often for him. Converse conservation strengthened by that mightiest quality in us, our uh, indolence. Sits for long ages, not victorious only, which he should be, but tyrannical, incommunicative. Sort of digression here on, on the importance of knowing how and why you are changing things. So we're on to chapter four. But now among French hopes is not that of old Madame de Maurepas. Was it Monsieur de Morepa, a nimble old man? It is Monsieur, who for all emergencies has a light jest, never in the worst confusion will emerge cork like unsunk. This he describes as the Nestor of France. And here is the man himself, Jean Frederic Philippot, Count of Morepa. Born at Versailles, family of administrative nobility. But he is the Nestor of France. You can see here he was mainly in office in seven, from 1723 to uh, 1749, the Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary of State of the Navy. And so really he, he's seen the 18th century in France. He is the Nestor age. At bottom, nevertheless, it might puzzle one to say where the government of France in these days especially is, in that chateau of Versailles, we have Nestor, king, queen. So this is Nestor, Count of Maurepas. King is Louis XVI, queen is Marie Antoinette. Ministers and clerks with their paper bundles tied in tape. But the government? But government is a thing that governs, that guides, and if need be, compels. You can see there, uh, Carlyle's belief in action. Human action. Yes, uh, Morapa is, is the Nestor of France. He's been there entrenched in the administrative state for the 18th century, but who is genuinely being the one who governs and being the one who compels? Because we see here, well, is it Morapa or was it a Voltaire? Was it those of the paper age, truly? So, in the tongue of the blabber, says Carlyle, in the pen, of the pamphleteer. These are the people who really govern France, who really compel France. France was long a despotism tempered by epigrams. And now it would seem the epigrams have got the upper hand. Nation tempered by epigrams. We can see here, despotism tempered by epigrams was a quote from Chamfort, Maxime's Pensée, Caractère, Et anecdote so from 1796, so for Carlyle it would have been more reference from a writer closer to the time itself. So from the minds of these epigrammists, who now have their Turgo in charge, this man, the great philosopher, the philosopher controller, there shall be endless reformation. Patriarch Voltaire, after long years of absence, is he revisiting Paris? There's rumours, this is the blabber. <laughs> because as always, the pen is Voltaire and D'Alembert and certain people are the writers, but really underneath them is this whole community of blabberers, as Carlyle sees them. Sneering Pan Parry has suddenly grown reverent, devotional with hero worship. You can see here this, the, the fact that he calls them the sneering Parisians. Uh, and Voltaire visiting France with, quote, his chariot is the nucleus of a comet whose train fills whole streets, is uh, reminiscent of how he calls out Voltaire in his hero, uh, lecture on hero and hero worship, which is the unbelieving, this is from here on hero worship now, he says, the unbelieving French believe in their Voltaire and burst out random into very curious hero worship 
the last act of his life when they stifle him under roses. It has always seemed to me extremely curious, this of Voltaire. Truly, if Christianity be the highest instance of hero worship, then we may find here in Voltairism one of the lowest. He whose life was that of a kind of antichrist does again on this side exhibit a curious contrast. No people ever were so little prone to admire at all those French of Voltaire. Persiflage was the character of their whole mind. Adoration had nowhere a place in it. Yet see, the old man of Fernay comes up to Paris, an old, tottering, infirm man of eighty-four years. They feel that he, too, is a kind of hero, that he has spent his life in opposing error and injustice, delivering calluses, unmasking hypocrites in high places, in short, that he, too, should, uh, though in a strange way, has fought like a valiant man. So, this is the train, this is the comet coming into Paris. Um, and Carlyle, as you can see, it's a false hero worship. They're very, the babbling glasses can be very uh, skeptical and sneering, yet when enters their Voltaire, they become extremely reverent. Chapter 5 Astrea Redux, without catch. Pretty much a chapter that does what it says in the tin. It's all very well and good to have uh, a to-go on the stage, but if the finances aren't there, how is uh, how are you going to actually improve the state? If you if you are in a dire deficit oriented world in the French, where is the money going to come from? And this isn't a question now of you know you can simply print, release the money through quantitative easing or something. This is the hard restrictive element of cash that paper money back then was fragile it was seen to be fragile and certainly if the other great powers were not using it then you would not be able to to finance yourself in the world stage as a world power like france and then chapter six windbags so marches the world in this paper age or era of hope not without obstructions war explosions which however heard from such distance are little other than a cheerful marching music, if indeed that dark living chaos of ignorance and hunger, five and twenty million strong under your feet, were to begin playing. He says, Prince d'Artois has with all the strangest horse leech, a moonstruck, much enduring individual of Neuchâtel in Switzerland, named Jean Paul Marat. When we talk of the Prince d'Artois, we talk of this man. The Count of Artois would later become Charles X, but uh, really we're talking about when he was the younger brother to Louis the Sixteenth, And he had under him this man, Jean-Paul Marat, who has we can see would become an important scientist, theorist, physician in France. He is the subject of the famous Jacques-Louis David painting, The Death of Marat. So this is what uh, Carlyle is getting at. We have this sort of, he's working under the younger brother of the king, Count d'Artois, um, so this this is the sort of intellectual in the paper age of France. Duchesse Polignac with a party is in the Bois de Boulogne waiting. Though it is drizzly winter, the 1st of December, 1783. So we can see this is what the paper age has done. We've gone forward 10 years, from 1774 to 1783. We've lived in this sort of environment. The young prince is full of hope. Prince d'Artois is his older brother, uh, Louis the Sixteenth. Voltaire, D'Alembert, this is the paper age. Beautiful invention, mounting heavenward so beautifully. Um, this is the, the whole chivalry of France, Duke de Chartres, foremost, gallops to receive him. The emblem of much and of our age of hope itself. And he moves on to chapter 7, the Contrat Social, which of course is referencing Rousseau. It's just another layer 
to this age of hope, this paper age. And I suppose really when he's talking about that, juxtaposing the age of hope with the paper age, he is getting into your mind the flimsiness and the ultimate worthlessness or weightlessness of the of paper. So the ho age of hope is the age of paper. There is nothing truly solid there. And sort of similar to that, you just have that idea of the social contract. And then in chapter 8, printed paper. So just another layer to add to it. Uh, in such a practical France, let the theory be perfectibility. Say what it will, discontents cannot be wanting. Your promised reformation is so indispensable, yet it comes not who will begin it with himself. Who will begin it with himself is uh, Signs of the Times, quotation from Signs of the Times of Carlyle. Of street ballads, of epigrams, that from our old tempered despotism we need not speak. Again, in the courts of law, with their money quarrels, divorce cases, wheresoever a glimpse of the household existence can be had, what indications the Parlement of Bassonson and ice ring audible to all France with the armors and destinies of a young Mirabeau. Renowned orator, leader in the early stages of the French Revolution. This man is in the south, he's in Nice en Provence, and they have their own local parliament down there. And he is raging through with his theories. Edacity, rapacity, quite contrary to the finer sensibilities of the heart. Fools that expect your verdant millennium, and nothing but love and abundance. Brooks, swimming wine, winds, whispering music, with the whole ground and basis of your existence, champ into a mud of sensuality which daily growing deeper will soon have no bottom but the abyss so you can see there's a nice sentence by Carlyle where he's really st starts by talking about the love and abundance that these fools want and actually what they're doing is they're eroding the ground beneath them and they're creating the abyss Weep, fair queen, thy first tears of unmixed wretchedness. This comes because um, he, he spins the night into that being uh, on Walpurgis, uh, Walpurgis dance. Marie Antoinette uh, ends up having some tears. Um, I think here it's some sort of, it's a scandal around. This is the Cardinal of Rouen, Louis René Edouard de Rouen. 1734 to 1803, Prince Rohan Goyen, Bishop of Strasbourg, politician, Cardinal of Roman Catholic Church. At a trial in 1786 before the Parliament of Paris, his acquittal was received with popular enthusiasm and regarded as a victory over the Royal Court of Versailles, and in particular, the Queen. This is the scene that Carlyle is talking about here. The diamond necklace scandal has occurred to Marie Antoinette. Cardinal de Rohan is released from the Bastille. And so we see through the popular applause in Paris of it that the affiliation of Marie Antoinette with the, this age of hope has turned. We're in 1786. Already the fast hastening generation responds to another glance at Beaumarchais' marriage de Figaro, which now in 1784, after difficulty enough, has issued on the stage and runs its hundred nights to the admiration of all men. By what virtue or internal vigour it so ran, the reader of our day will rather wonder, and indeed will now so much the better that it flattered some pruriency of the time that it spoke, or all were feeling and longing to speak small stu substance in that Figaro, this is the manager Figaro by uh, Beaumarchais, Thin wire-drawn intrigues, you can still get it. The Oxford paper, uh, Oxford World Classics edition in any good bookshop, so it's still a quite popular one, but uh, Carlyle obviously was not a fan. Thin wire-drawn intrigues, thin wire-drawn sentiments and sarcasms, a uh, thing lean, barren, yet which winds and whisks itself as through a holy mad universe at Watley with a high, sniffing air. Which, although he doesn't like it, I think he likes the fact that this marriage of Figaro staged in the 1780s really 
does encapsulate the age in which it, which it was written. Still more significant are two books. This is the paper age after all, so he has to close it out with references to some actual books. They're produced on the eve of the uh, ever-memorable explosion itself. Saint-Pierre's Paul uh, Virginie and Louvet's Chevalier de Fableau. Yet, on the whole, our good Saint-Pierre is musical. This is the Saint-Pierre who wrote the former one he's talked about, Paul et Virginie. Poetical, though most morbid, we call his book The Swan Song of Old Dying France. Louvet's, again, let no man account musical. Truly, if this wretched Fableau, or Fabla, is a death speech, it is one under the gallows, and by a felon that does not repent. So we see here, this is Bernardin's de saint Pierre's Paul in Virginia. Paul et Virginie, novel by Jacques-Henri Bernardin de saint Pierre, first published 1788. So when he's talking about uh, these books being published right on the eve of the uh, explosion, he's not wrong. As close as you can get to it. And you can see here why it's more... Uh, admirable to Carlyle than the later one. He, it, it records the fate of a child of nature corrupted by the artificial sentimentality of the French upper classes in the late 18th century. So what's interesting about the, this is the final chapter and the final sentence on the paper age. And what's interesting is that sentence right there really that we see the artificial sentimentality of the French upper classes. Mm of the time. That when Louis the Sixteenth comes in, 1774, there is this false storm. Um, but it is hollow, or you could you could say it is paper thin. It's not something which genuinely wants to change the world for the better. We saw that with the, when Carlyle calls out that the working classes have experienced no difference in this age. It's really a the upper classes or those sitting just outside the, the complete upper classes, as in anyone not born in Versailles, but of the upper class, so to speak, um, patting themselves on the back of a job well done, when in fact they've done no job. They've just been printing paper, and they have been letting Paris blabber. So it is on that note that he closes book two, The Paper Age. Next, we'll continue to look at France just before the revolution through the institution, the Parliament of Paris, Parliament of Paris.